Well, now I will ask uh, uh, Dr. Johannes Haile Selassie from Ethiopia, but who work in Cleveland, to talk about the middle Pliocene and hominid diversity in new fossil evidence from the Waranzo Mille Central Afar, a beautiful, beautiful place in Afar that I know very well. And um, uh, Johannes, you will, I think, uh, say a few words also on the uh, Ardipithecus that, that you know very well. Well, thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Professor Kopans. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Academy for inviting me to be part of this magnificent audience. I'm really uh, privileged to be here. Um, secondly, I was not actually prepared to talk about Ardipithecus, but um, I would say a few things about Ardipithecus before I get to my talk, which is the uh, mid Pliocene hominid diversity. Now, I was part of the um, team that discovered Ardipithecus cadaba and also Ardipithecus ramidus. And Ardipithecus cadaba was found in uh, the 1990s, as was Ardipithecus ramidus. And at that time, um, especially with the discovery of Ardipithecus cadaba, we had uh, Ororintogenensis announced from Kenya that he heard from uh, Professor um, uh, Senu. And we, we, we named Ardipithecus cadaba based on a few fragments, dental fragments and the mandib mandibular fragments. But at that time, it was really exciting because they were the oldest human ancestors found in the fossil record because our dating gave us a date of about 5.2 to 5.8 million years ago. And by that time, all we had as the oldest hominid was Ardipithecus ramidus at 4.4. So with the discovery of Ardipithecus cadaba, we literally um, pushed our record of human origins by about a million and a half years. And that was really exciting. And we tried to come up with what are the key features that make Ardipithecus cadaba a hominid on our lineage and not on the ape lineage. And uh, we've, all, we've, we've known for a long time that apes are distinguished from our um, close ancestors, closest ancestors like what we call hominins, by two major features. One is bipedality, walking on two legs. And the second feature that we've been using is the lack of the canine sharpening or what we call canine honing complex. So those were like the definitive features of what we used to call as hominins, which is our part of the uh, evolutionary history. So when we found Ardipithecus cadaba, uh, we tried to see if the specimens actually show some sign of bipedality, and also if they've lost the canine honing complex. And luckily we had few canines, or at least a couple canines, that we could actually test that hypothesis. And also um, a toe bone that um, Professor Sunny mentioned earlier during her, her talk. And based on these specimens, we concluded that Ardipithecus cadaba was actually on, on our lineage and not on the ape lineage. The canine was not a honing canine, and the foot phalanx that we found was more like what we've seen in litter species like Australopithecus afrensis. So based on that, we put it into Ardipithecus cadaba being the earliest human ancestor that we had in the fossil record. Then of course, at that time, we also had Ororintogenensis from, uh, from Kenya. And one of the things that I tried to do uh, later on, like after three years uh, after naming uh, Ardipithecus cadaba was, how is Ororintogenensis different from Ardipithecus cadaba? Now, you've heard that we don't have comparative samples from both species, and that makes our comparative analysis really difficult. But by looking at one of the most significant elements of the body, which is the canine, I saw a lot of similarities between the canine of uh, Ororintogenensis and uh, Ardipithecus cadaba. And to me, at that point, I didn't see a lot of difference to actually recognize those two groups as different and suggested that maybe they belong to the same genus, or maybe we could recognize them as different species, but not different genus. That was my, my conclusion. But we moved on to talk about Ardipithecus ramidus, which is much younger than Ardipithecus cadaba, and the story that we learned from Ardipithecus ramidus was totally different and unexpected, actually, to see 
a hominin ancestor with opposable big toe, an animal that could actually climb on trees efficiently, but at the same time also walk on two legs, one on the ground. Now, I wasn't really part of the uh, detailed description of Ardipithecus ramidus, but what we know from Ardipithecus ramidus is that its morphological features were a mix of a bipedal creature and a creature that could actually climb up trees uh, when, whenever necessary. So this was like one, one leg on the trees and another leg on, on the ground. So that was one of the fascinating discoveries that we, ha we had in the 1990s. So we can talk about those and their relationships later on, but today I'm gonna talk about mid-Pliocene home and diversity. Now I've moved from like the older part to uh, mid-Pliocene getting younger. And by mid-Pliocene, we're talking about the time period between three and four million years ago. Now, I just want to say um, a few things about the theme of this colloquium, which is who was who, and who did what, where and when. These are all questions that we've been trying to answer for many, many, many decades, or more than a century. But if you're expecting a single answer to any of these questions, you're not going to get it from me. Nor are you going to get it from all of my colleagues who are here today. But we've been trying to answer those questions for a very long time, and we always try to come up with meaningful answers and also try to make up additional questions from the answers that we get and keep on going in order to effectively understand who we are, where we came from, and when. So when we look at the mid-Pliocene human diversity, we now have some evidence that there was actually some kind of diversity where multiple species of early human ancestors lived at the same time. And this is based on the evidence, the fossil evidence that we have from this site known as Waranzo Mille, which is a relatively new site located in the Afar region of Ethiopia. Now, as you all know, uh, the Afar Rift is located in uh, Ethiopia, and uh, for the last um, 50 years, and um, Professor Kopans was one of the pioneers of uh, work in, in the Afar region since the early 1970s. Researchers have been really attracted to this part of Ethiopia, which, which is no, known as the, um, the Afar Triangle. And uh, they've been going to specifically this area here, showed in yellow uh, eclipse here, uh, known as the Afar um, region of Ethiopia. And uh, here is what it looks like when, when we get closer on a satellite photo. So what we're seeing here is Middle Awash uh, to the south, Gona, Dikika, Hadar, Lady Gararu, Waranzo Mille, and uh, Mille Logia. And each of these sites have yielded numerous fossil remains of early human ancestors, especially Middle Awash, which is one of the largest sites in the country, has produced so many species in the fossil record. And what you're seeing here is probably a partial list of what has been found. But what's really interesting about the Middle Arch site is that it represents the last six million years of our evolutionary history. So we have specimens ranging from six million years all the way to the emergence of anatomically modern Homo sapiens. At Gona, we have uh, various species, including the earliest ones, such as Ardipithecus cadaba, Ardipithecus ramidus, and also we have remains of Homo erectus. Looking at Hara and Dekika, we have Australopithecus afarensis. This is where Lucy was found. We also have remains of Homo as part of the earliest Homo from, uh, from Hara. Moving on, we now have this new site uh, called Lady Gararu, where we have um, discovered uh, an early Homo uh, specimen, which is dated to about 2.8 million years ago. And this kind of pushes the origin of our genus a little bit by about 300,000 from what was previously known. So when you look at what has come from Ethiopia, all these red dots that you see on the map are sites that have yielded fossil remains of our ancestors. And the, the, the list that you're seeing on uh, the right side represents this, the list of taxa that have been found from sites in, in Ethiopia. So it's really rich in terms of the uh, fossil evidence that we have, but it doesn't mean that Ethiopia is the only country that we have fossils from. You've heard uh, Ron talk about the discoveries from South Africa, but also there are discoveries from Kenya, as you heard from uh, Professor Senu. Now, 
If you compare the fossil evidence that we have from South Africa to that of Kenya and to that is coming out of Ethiopia, you can clearly see that there is a continuous record on the Ethiopian side uh, documenting the entire evolutionary history that we know so far about human origins. But today I'm going to talk about just a window of time, three to four million years ago, uh, from a site called Ranzumida, which is also located at, in the Afar region of Ethiopia. So Waranzo Mille, I started working here uh, in 2004, uh, and really when we went there, I didn't have any idea in terms of how old it was going to be, uh, but obviously as a fresh graduate mint from college, I really wanted to have my own site, and I did a lot of survey in this part of uh, the Afar region, and luckily we found this place called Waranzo Mille. Now, as you can see on this slide, um, we've already discovered more than 150 hominid specimens, mostly isolated teeth, but we do have maxillae, mandibles, some postcrania, we have a partial skeleton, and we also have recently found a cranium. We also have a, a tremendous amount of faunal assemblage, also from this uh, site, uh, which, which includes about 12,000 specimens, vertebrate specimens, and invertebrate specimens uh, collected from the site for the last, from the last 15 years. Uh, we have about, so far, we have about 70 mammalian taxa identified, some reptiles and some birds, all dated to between three and four million years ago. The invertebrates are also uh, very common, uh, especially in uh, settings where there were like paleo lakes and so forth. And uh, this faunal assemblage is usually what we use to reconstruct the past environment in, in which these early human ancestors lived. So, what are the major discoveries from Moranzo Mille that are specifically related to what I'm going to talk about today, which is mid Pliocene hominid diversity? The first one is the one you see on the left side, what we call the Brutale foot, uh, BRT 273. The one in the middle is part of a new species that we named Australopithecus de Uremida. And the, la the last one on the right side is a partial skeleton of Australopithecus afarensis, which is called Cadanumu. Uh, uh, now, in order to understand the significance of these fossils, we have to understand how old they are. We have to figure out how old they are. And our geologists have been working on the stratigraphy, the dating of this site. And what you're seeing here is some of the sections that they've come up with. And looking closely, you will see that some of these layers have been radiometrically dated. And the oldest dated tuff that we have that we see at the bottom is about 3.82 million years old. And this is like the older sequence. And as you go higher in the sequence, it goes all the way up to about 3 million years. So technically, we're talking about a time period that is really critical in our evolutionary history, which is the time between 3 and 4 million years ago. Now, based on what they've done from the older section and the younger section, this is the composite section that they've come up with. And what you're seeing on this slide is where we have all the localities plugged into the stratigraphy. And on the right side, we have the names of the species that have been found from the sequence at the Waranza Mille site. So as you can see already, some of the lines overlap, which indicates that at least two species were living at the same time in the same place. So here is an example of what we have from the older section, uh, older than 3.6 all the way to 3.8. This is just a partial uh, view of some of the specimens that we have. And um, from the 3.6 million year old sediment, we have this beautiful partial skeleton, not as complete as um, little foot, but close, I'd say. <laughs> and uh, higher up in the sequence, we have from 3.5 all the way to 3 million years, we have a number of specimens, including what you're seeing on this slide, that belong to Australopithecus afarensis. Now, don't forget that afarensis is the most commonly known species from this time period, and no wonder we're finding remains of the species at Waranza Mille also. But within that time period, from 3.5 to 3.5 million years to 3 million years, we also have specimens that we recognized as different species known as Australopithecus deiramida. Also within that time period, we have this partial foot known as the Brutale foot. 
So the question now is, when you look at that green rectangle, there are also red and blue rectangles in it. And this is the basis for my talk today about middle Pliocene hominid diversity. So all of these fossils that I have shown you, most of them have been uh, published uh, in um, peer-reviewed journals. And we even have talked about Pliocene hominid diversity already, as you can see on the bottom uh, left corner, which was published uh, about a year ago. So we've shared all the information that we have uh, with our colleagues, and of course, we, we've got some critics back, uh, about, especially about the validity of some of the uh, taxa that we've named from the site. So in order to um, talk about diversity, the first question is, was there hominid diversity during the Middle Pliocene? And in order to answer this question, at least based on the, the fossil material from Moran Zemile, what I would ask is, is the Bortelli foot different from the foot of Australopithecus afarensis? Because afarensis is also known from that time period. And secondly, is the Uramida really different from Australopithecus afarensis? Those are the two key questions that we need to answer in order to address whether there was middle Pliocene diversity or not. So let me start with the foot. So this foot has opposable big toe. Now, humans don't have opposable big toe. And also, Atticus afarensis, as we know it, did not have as opposable big toe as what we see in, for example, the um, uh, Ardipithecus partial skeleton, which clearly has opposable big toe. But we know afarensis didn't have opposable big toe because of evidence that we have from even older sediments in Tanzania, at the place called Laitoli, where you see that little footprint in the middle which belongs to a species, the species of Australopithecus afarensis. So that foot that you, you saw on the previous slide, Bortelli foot, wouldn't have been the foot to make that print. So that clearly shows you that there were like two kinds of walking uh, mechanisms by 3.4 to 3.6 million years ago, clearly showing that the Bortelli foot does not really belong to Australopithecus afarensis. How about the new species that we named? Australopithecus de Ramada. Now, we use the one on the right side, the, oh, sorry, the, the one on the left side as the holotype of the uh, species, and the one on the left side, the mandible, is part of the paratype. Now, how did you distinguish this as different from Australopithecus afarensis? First of all, Australopithecus de Ramada had smaller teeth compared to what we've seen in Australopithecus afarensis. Secondly, when we look at the canine, which is really an important element in our uh, evolutionary studies, we see that this canine is actually more primitive than the canines of Australopithecus afarensis. We also see that this species had very thick enamel. Now, thick enamel characterizes a lot of the later hominins, but we also see thick enamel in this group, uh, Australopithecus de Ramada. We also see some morphology of the, the, the jaw, the lower jaw, where the, the, the body of the mandible is really inflated, unlike what we see in um, Australopithecus afarensis. There are also some other detailed morphological features that distinguish Australopithecus de Romeda from Australopithecus afarensis. By simply looking at this slide, you look at the line up, up, the line up at, at the top, like the four mandibles, and look at the lower ones, you can actually clearly see that the lower left is kind of different from the other ones that you're seeing. So this is like um, a visual uh, differentiation, but the detailed morphology also tells you that it's really different from those of Australopithecus afarensis. So we, we did a detailed analysis um, in terms of the comparison because one of the key objectives that we had was to actually distinguish Australopithecus de Ramada from the nearby Australopithecus afarensis. <laughs> Because people would argue that what we have is actually Australopithecus afarensis. And we came up with a number of characters that, are, that distinguish Australopithecus de Eromeda from Australopithecus afarensis. We also compared it with other hominins that are known from that time period, such as Australopithecus pahal Ghazali that Professor Brunet mentioned earlier, and also Kinatropus palladiums. And there are differences that we can actually document between those taxa and the new species that we named Australopithecus de Ramada. So based on that, going back to the satellite imagery of Ronzo Mille, what you're seeing here is the hominins that we've recovered from this middle Pliocene deposits at Ronzo Mille. And 
The ones on top, some of them are Australopithecus afarensis specimens, and some others, especially from the older deposits, belong to its ancestor, Australopithecus anamensis. The ones at the bottom, we have Afarensis skeleton and Australopithecus deiremida, which is very close to the Burta leftwood. So here is an example of a diversity that we can show from the middle uh, Pliocene. So we argue that there was indeed diversity during the middle Pliocene. There were at least two or three species present living at the same time. But what makes Waranzo Mille unique is because this taxa lived in the same area at the same time. Because when you think about mid Pliocene diversity, Australopithecus Bahar Ghazali was present at 3.5, which is about the same time as Australopithecus afarensis living in uh, Eastern Africa. Kenyanthropus Pladiops was also from the Middle Pliocene, living in Kenya, not in Ethiopia. But this is a unique opportunity to show that this related taxa were actually living in the same area at the same time. This is what we've been arguing about Middle Pliocene diversity since we found these specimens. But then you say, why does, <coughs> why does mid Pliocene homo diversity matter? What is, this, what is the significance of figuring out whether there was diversity or not? Why, why are we worried about that? Well, prior to the 1990s, this is all we knew. All we knew was that there was one species very early, at about three million years ago, known as Australopithecus afarensis, and that's the species that gave rise to everything that came after that. Now, at that time, we know that between three and two million years ago, there was some kind of hominid diversity. We had Homo, we had Paranthropus, and later on added uh, Australopithecus garhi. So nobody had doubted about the diversity in early hominins between the time, between two and three million years ago. Now, 20 years later, our phylogenetic tree changed and we added a number of specimens to that tree. As you can see, between three and four, now you have a lineup of, of uh, at least four or five species. So you ask yourself, like, okay, well, we've, we've seen diversity during the middle of Pliocene, uh, during the, um, between two and three million years ago, but was there similar diversity between three and four million years ago? And what we're seeing here is, it looks like there was, okay, and not just four, but if Prometheus is also 3.6 million years old, we have another species that, that was also there during the middle of Pliocene. But most of our colleagues would argue that all these four taxa, Australopithecus de Eremida, Australopithecus Baragazali, Afarensis, and Kenanthropus Platyops, they all belong to a single species, Australopithecus Afarensis. That's how they're arguing. But there is that foot, the, the Bortelia foot which cannot really be included to any of this. What that means is even if all four are merged into a single species of Australopithecus afarensis, there is still a second species that was around living at the same time as Australopithecus uh, afarensis. So, what next? Now, given the diversity, I think what's really important is to figure out how did they manage to live alongside each other, right? How, how did they coexist? Because there has to be a lot of competition here. Because if there are like multiple species, related species doing probably the same thing or close to uh, the same thing, there has to be some mechanism to allow them to actually coexist. And this is like the major question that we would like to address. Uh, is it because of adaptive radiation that they, were, that they diversified? Or is it because of habitat partitioning, need partitioning. They were occupying different parts of the environment. That's why they were able to coexist. Or did they have different dietary adaptations? They were eating different things. Or did they have different locomotor adaptations? Well, at least for that one, we know that at least there were two modes of locomotor adaptation during the middle Pliocene, one represented by the Burtelle foot, and a second one represented by Australopithecus uh, afarensis. Then the, key, the other key question is, because prior to the 1990s, Afarensis was like the common ancestor, right? 
So Homo must have come from some branch of Australopithecus afarensis at some point. Now, when you have multiple species during the Middle Pliocene, any of them could have given rise to the genus Homo. But which one is the best candidate? So it gives us the opportunity to actually look for more to see if any of these new species that are being named, or who knows, we might end up naming more species in the future, would be better fit to be the ancestor of the genus Homo. Now, we're also pushing the record of the genus Homo back in time. Two decades ago, it was, the earliest Homo was about 2.3, 2.2, and now it's gone up to 2.8 million years ago. And there is a possibility that we might even find the earliest Homo older than 2.8 million years ago, which brings us to what happened during the middle Pliocene to understand wh which one the earliest Homo might be. So are there more middle Pliocene species yet to be found? Quite possible, but we can't predict until we find the fossils. So that's, that's what I have about middle Pliocene diversity, and thank you. Very good.